حبيب قلوب العالمين أبو قاسم مصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى تيبين الطاهرين ولا أصحاب المتجبين إلى يوم الدين ولا نطلع على أدها مجمعين First and foremost, all praise belongs to Allah, the Lord and Master of the world. I'd like to thank the community for inviting me once again and uh, thank Mohsen for his exaggerated introduction. Um, I actually think his introduction is probably a better speech. <laughs> but um, tonight, uh, I wanted to, for those of you who uh, came last time in March, we talked about Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. And Joseph Campbell, as you know, is a psychologist who developed a protocol for examining human beings and helping human beings solve some of their issues and make sense of their lives. And in and the hero's journey is a 12-step process in which the human being is called to adventure and goes on a path of self-discovery and overcomes obstacles. And in overcoming those obstacles and making sense of their lives, that's how they become heroic. But what's interesting about Joseph Campbell's work is that he developed this model by studying three holy personalities. He studied the Buddha, he studied Moses, and he studied Jesus. And he studied their lives and their story and developed this methodology. A methodology that requires self-reflection, self-discovery, self-analysis, what is commonly referred to as muhasaba, accountability, self-accountability. And in the next, since we're going to be together for a week or so, and given that we will be together in these last 10 nights, which are considered the holiest of the nights of Ramadan, it's really a time to self-reflect individually and also self-reflect as a collective. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Where are we headed? These are the kinds of questions that we'll be grappling with. Uh, and these are the questions, to, to, put, to put it quite frankly, are the purpose of what we are doing in this month to discover who we are, who we really are. And the, way, the first step to discovering who we really are is by saying no. Saying no to the base desires, saying no to our animal instincts, saying no to the day and opening ourselves to the night. We are rearranging our lifestyle for a month so that we can know how to live the rest of the year. And given the topic that I was asked to discuss, in the, or the theme that I was asked to discuss in the, in the next seven nights, and tomorrow, I promise, I'll have a PowerPoint for you. I had the PowerPoint ready, but I, f I figured tonight is more kind of a Khodemuni type of talk. You get to know each other a little bit, and, and then from there, we'll go into a little bit more uh, heavy-duty heavy mental lifting. Um, one of the customs of the month of Ramadan is every night, we recite a dua, with, which is called the du'a of iftitah. Iftitah in the Arabic language means opening. It's the same word for fatiha. The opening. And what are we opening? What are we asking for? We are opening our hearts and our minds to the realities of the universe, the mysteries of the universe. And in particular, there is a line in Dua Iftita, which I think will be our theme for the coming nights. Allahumma inni 
نرقب إليك في دولة كريم تعز به إسلام وأهله وتذل به نفاق وأهله And a rough translation of this line in Dua after Ta'af. You read this Dua every night before Maghrib, which is, as I understand, something we do here, right? We recite Quran, we uh, do this Dua. We are asking the Almighty, we are beseeching the Almighty, Inni narqabu ilayk fi dawlati kareem. Draw us. It's a collective dua from the very outset. We're not asking about individuals. Say, oh Allah, oh Almighty, oh the one, oh the absolute, draw us, narqa qurbat, means to come, bring us nearer to you, into dawlat karim a governance of karama, a governance of dignity. Let's analyze this word, karama, which is a word that was included in the title of the talk. From the very outset, Allah says about Adam, says, لَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي Adam." We have bestowed karama on the children of Adam. Karamah has been described as honor, it has been described as dignity, it has been described as um, an elevated place, an elevated position, something divine, something, when you look at Adam, what makes him kareem, what makes him, gives him karama is not the mud or the flesh from which he was made. What makes Adam worthy of dignity and value is the fact that he, the Almighty, has bestowed and breathed into Adam from himself, from his own spirit something intangible, something non-physical, something that is not visible or touchable or feelable with our five senses. And Ramadan and the practice of fasting in general is all about learning this identity, the spiritual identity the true identity, the eternal identity of the human being. And it is an identity that, to put it quite frankly, is ignored in much of our daily lives. We are so caught up in the day-to-day -day hassle of what's called the dunya or the trivial world that we almost forget what it is we really are. And I'll give you an analogy. It's like someone going on a trip. They're going to a faraway place, and there's a stop in between, right? You have a one-day layover in a city. And as you're spending time in this motel, all of a sudden, you, you start to decorate this hotel. You start to invest a lot, not knowing that you're actually leaving. You're, you're passing through this motel, going to another place. You get so caught up in redesigning and remodeling and making this motel that's on the way to a greater destination that you forget why you're, where you're headed and where you're going altogether. And that is the deception of the world. And that is the deception of the lower self. They say that in this month, the shayateen are locked up. But yet we still see evil and wrongdoing and injustice in the world. 
That itself is a proof that most of the wrongdoing and darkness and evil in the world is not the fault of the shaitan. The real source of inequity, dispossession, injustice in the world is ourselves. And we have no one to blame but ourselves, and we have no one to account to except for ourselves. And that is a very important point. This nafs, this nafs amara bisu that we talk about, the self that commands and demands and is almost like an internal tyrant in the way it operates. And the way we are able to learn that we are this ruh, this spirit, is to say no to it. A few years ago, there was a movie called Yes Man. Have you, heard, have you seen that movie? You know the subject of that movie? Okay, so just a brief overview. I don't want you to, you don't have to go watch it, but it was, yes is the new no. And this, this, Jim Carrey is the star of this movie, and he's, in the beginning of the movie, he's a guy who never does anything. He doesn't take any adventures. He doesn't take any risks. He doesn't live life as it should be lived, right? So he goes to this self-help seminar, and the motto of the seminar is yes. Say yes to everything, no matter what it is. So the movie kind of goes through all these yeses that he says to things that he ordinarily wouldn't do, and it shows kind of the path of life that he takes because of that. And in the end, he realizes that the point of that yes is not to say yes to everything, but to say yes with certain qualifications. Well, here's our faith. It starts with the word la, no. But if you stay there, if that's all it is, then faith and religion, or however you want to call it, becomes kind of a restraining and constraining kind of uh, do's and don'ts type of thing, a prescriptive approach to faith. But what people don't see is that it's a complete formula. It's la ilaha illallah. To say no to all those things that can control you so that you can elevate and transcend into the absolute one. So it's a process, right? When you say no to lower things, you have no choice but to elevate to higher things. It's the process of transcendence. And this is the beauty of Ramadan, and that's the beauty of these last 10 nights, because that's what we're supposed to be learning. So in the next seven nights, uh, we'll be focusing on the letters. And how much time do I have, by the way? 50? Oh, I have 15 minutes. Good. Okay, so I want to introduce the topic now that we'll be exploring in the next seven nights. And it begins with the Fatiha that we recite. And you all know this surah. It is considered the crown jewel of the, of the revelation of the Quran. And it is considered kind of the abstract, the comprehensive message of what the divine call is and where the divine call is taking us. So as we recite this surah over and over again, And we say, إِهْدِنَا الصَّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صَرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ قَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Guide us to صراط المستقيم, the path that's مستقيم. And مستقيم here does not mean straight path. Here, I know that's a little bit of, I'm going to do this a lot over the next seven days. I'm going to redefine a lot of words. Mustaqim comes from the word istiqama, which means to stand firm. So 
standing firm in the trials and tribulations of things that are other than divine. <coughs> and that is the process of purification. Sirat al Mustaqim is a path of resisting other than the Almighty. Resisting lower desires, controlling the self, becoming the God of the self. Amir al Mumain, the commander of the faithful, says, Man arafa nafsahu, faqad arafa rabbahu. Whoever knows themselves, there's nafs. knows their Lord. This is the process. And these nights, the archetype that we will be stu studying in these seven nights, so we talked about Joseph Campbell, Buddha, Moses, Jesus. We will be, in the next seven nights, at every turn, somehow invoking the life and the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib. For that is how the Messenger had, and Allah the Almighty has wanted it. That in these nights, when we think about all these questions and all these adventures and all these processes, that we think about all of these things from the beginning to the end, from the Aleph to the Yat, from the Alpha to the Omega, we are thinking about all of these things through the prism of the commander of the faithful. And we will journey the different parts of the world in the coming nights. We will look at the Greek philosophers. We will look at the Vikings. We will look at the Buddhists. We will look at the Hindus. And we will find and discover what Ali has to do with all of these paths that have come before us. And why the messenger of Allah says, that Sirat al-Mustaqim is Ali ibn Abi Talib. That is why the Messenger of Allah says on the day of Ghadir that Islam is Ali ibn Abi Talib. When people say Islam is peace, Islam is this, the way we will see the definition of Islam, and we talked about the definition of Islam last time, from the Old Testament. I don't know if you remember that, but we'll review that again. Because fi bida islamu qariba wa sayudu qariba fatubu li quraba fatubu li quraba fatubu li quraba Islam began as something strange, something unfamiliar. And it will then again return to being something strange and unfamiliar, as we can experience in the world today, right? So it started off as something strange. It will again become something strange. Fatubu li qurba, give glad tidings to the strangers. And the Prophet repeats this three times. Islam will be something that we really don't understand in the times that we're living. And so it will take, it will, it will be as if this Dawlat al karim that we're talking about will be as if it is a brand new system because it will be so different than what's been practiced and what people think it is that it will seem like something totally different. So we will begin to re-examine some of these strange things that have happened and how to reclaim and recapture this divine pathway. And how many minutes do I have left? I told you, I, know, I usually just get exhausted at a certain point. That's how I know it's like 25 minutes. So I'm almost there. Um, so. Let me just end with a question instead of an answer. After
after we recite the Fatiha, what is the first statement that follows it? Anybody? Okay, then? No. In the Quran, if you go in the order, Alif Lam Mim. Right? This is called the Huruf Mughata'i or Mughata'at, however you want to pronounce it. So here we're asking the Divine for true guidance. And the answer to this prayer is three mysterious letters. Alif, Lam, Mim. And most of the time when you read exegesis or descriptions of what these letters are, the answer is something like, we don't know what they are. We don't know where they come from. Only the Almighty knows what they are. And then it says, Alif la Mim, and then it says, Dhalika Kitab ala Reba Fi. It doesn't say, Hadha Kitab la Reba Fi. It says, Dhalika Kitab ala Reba Fi. It's not, even, it's not even pointing to itself. It's saying, that is the book that is guidance for those who are, have consciousness. So from the very outset, the Quran begins not like any other book. Most of our stories that we tell each other are very linear. In the beginning, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. That's how we tell stories, right? In a very step-by-step -step process. But that's not how Allah tells the story. He says, you want guidance? Okay, let me give you something that you don't even have an answer for. Let me create more confusion in you. <coughs> let me create a question in you. What is, are these letters? And rather than avoid the question... I invite you and myself to embrace the question. What are these letters? Imam Jafar al-Sadiq salam he says in his discussion with Mufaddal ibn Omar, he says, if the Almighty just sent one letter, Alif, it would have been enough. But then the human beings would be confused. If he had just sent one letter, all of the message, all of the history, everything would, is contained in, it, in the Alif. But it's too much, too fast, it's too dense. So we created all the other letters to explain what this is. And I invite you to start to think and grapple with these divine mysteries, rather than looking at religion as a cookbook, a prescriptive approach. See, religion in the, what makes religion a strange thing in the modern times is that most institutionalized religions approach faith like a cookbook, a list of do's and don'ts. But I invite you to, to look at faith, not as a cookbook, not discounting that. There's a, if I'm learning how to cook something for the first time, a cookbook is very helpful. But if I stay there, there's, there's the descriptive approach to faith, there's the prescriptive approach to faith, but I invite you to the more creative approach to the faith, to embrace the mystery, to embrace the unknown, to embrace the uncertainty. And don't be hesitant in this path, because that is the path that needs istighama. That is the path towards salvation. That's why Quran begins with the mysterious letters. Not to, a question to be avoided, but a question to be embraced. Who is Alif Lam Mim? What is Alif Lam Mim? Where is Alif Lam Mim? Where is it in all the other scriptures? What is its meaning? What is its purpose? What is it? How is it a source of guidance? No answers tonight. Just think about it. And I don't promise you that there will be an answer. 
But we will explore this kind of question because think about it. In the last 10 nights, we are asked to recite three surahs, right? Can anyone name them for me? Surah Ankabut, which is what? Imagine a chapter named Spiders. Another chapter we're supposed to read is Surah Rum, both of which begin with Alif Lam Mim. And the third chapter we're supposed to read is called Al Dukhan, Ether or Steam or, again, Mysterious. And that begins with Hami. So in all cases, we are asked to first become confused and then proceed to think and then proceed to put these pieces together. So faith becomes like a puzzle, a puzzle of the self and putting things together and trying to make sense of what life is. I must be done now. So with that introduction, I'd like to thank you once again for hosting and inviting me into this particular holy time of the month to engage in these deep questions because I hope to learn a lot from you in terms of how you think about yourself and your nafs and your reality through the divine letters. And that then hopefully we can build this divine just state Literally, one letter at a time. Aquli qawla hada wa astaghfir lakum wa salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Rasfar, for this great intro to the uh, next seven nights uh, and giving us something to actually go back home and think about, I think uh, he, uh, he gave us something literal to, to go back home and uh, research and come back tomorrow prepared to listen to part two. Uh, we have five minutes of uh, Q&A time. Uh, if anyone has a question, the, the room is pretty small, so you may not need a mic, and I can come to you with the microphone. Is the uh, number 19 in the Quran the number of the uh, angels of the guardians in the same sort of principle as that? Sure. Do we, do we need to research that? Great question. Um, you're asking a question about numbers. And as you know, the letters of the Quran are simultaneously numbers. So the letter, and beyond that, each letter has at least nine properties. See, in the modern world, whether it's any, we have become disconnected from those properties. When we look at letters, all we think of is a pronunciation cue. We think of this letter as something to pronounce it because for the last four or five hundred, for, for the last thousand years, we have only focused on pronunciation, which is like focusing only on the car paint of a car instead of the whole picture. So the number 19, and other numbers for that, for that might have tremendous significance. And we could talk about the significance of these codes as we go along. Um, the number 19 you're talking about um, where Allah in the Quran says, and above them are tis'a uh, ashara. There's over them are 19. And so what is this mystery of 19? And there have been many theories and there have been many explorations. And while um, I don't think the object is to say this is the definitive answer, but again, it opens up this type of approach to exploring um, the numbers. Because in numbers, you have a very precise system. And this kind of also invites a mathematical approach to understanding scripture. And this approach is also used with the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, it's called the gematria, where they study how the numbers 
code things and how, what they say about things and everything has a number. Um, if you look at the last verse of Surah Jinn, it says, and for everything we have ascribed a adad, a number. And number to me is the language of precision. The language, it also invites us to a different kind of methodology for approaching uh, our relationship with the Almighty, a more precise uh, relationship. And I'll give you an example. The philosopher, the great philosopher Pythagoras, what people don't know about Pythagoras is that he did mathematics, he did geometry, what's called sacred geometry, for the purpose of understanding the divine. And he had actually a group, and he talks about the purpose of math being finding the divine, finding the absolute. And that's something that most people in the modern world don't realize about mathematics. That mathematics is uh, the language of the scripture. And uh, it actually uh, invites us to a very different kind of methodology because mathematics, the kind of proof required in mathematics is not what we call narration proof, where you have to look at the people who narrated, where they come from, which is very in, imprecise science. It's intrinsically true. It's, in, it's deductively true. So, so I, I'm very appreciative of this question because... The mathematical value of the phrase wahed, oneness, is 19. Sure. So therefore, I think Aleph not me and his order and all of that somehow is to do with the structure of this number. Yes. Because it has a mathematical value sure. and it plays its role there. Yes. Because you ask us to think about it. Sure, so excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's, you know, the, the word Bismillah rahman rahim is 19 letters, right? Um, and I'll give you even another interesting one. If you add up all the letters of the names of the Ahl al-Bayt, it's also 19. Just to take something from tonight. Quran verse 19 is Quran is divided in two parts, more common than the Yes. What the Shabbat uh, not real people and uh, common people, they want to think about it. Which Alif Bal meme is also one of those, which the majority of people they don't know. And also immediately says uh, that the more which is unwanted power, is enough for you to be guided. And uh, do you recommend that first goes at least for half time? Because first of all, this is not practical for the community that before understanding the Quran properly, the Muhammad properly, and then go or mix up with Mutashar Art, which is not going to end up to any place. And there's somebody like you who are in research and they go, they dig everything and they have the facilities and tools that they can find it out, which is not available for the majority of the people. And with this time of life, it's not practical. So what is your recommendation that even with this, because of religion is the only, have the only is the first most important part of our life, everybody should spend some time to learn Quran and to learn the prophet. So do you recommend this? Finish with the Mokamot, at least we know what is the essential part of what the Ummul Kitab says to us, then we go to the Motashabihat. Because Motashabihat sometimes, they may end up to some Motashabihat, they may not go for generations. My, my quick answer to this question is a great question, first of all. Um, Imam Jafar al-Sadaq salam says that, first of all, the the relation between mutashabih and muhkam is not necessarily either or. Because something that begins as mutashabih, as you become more certain and understanding increases, it becomes muhkam. So Imam Jafar Salah says, there is no mutashabih for us, the Ahl al-Bayt. So seek knowledge from us. Because everything is muhkam. So mutashabe is, for example, the use of similitudes to learn. So when we, when we look at the process of learning, 
The process of learning involves analogy. Analogy is a lower level of proof, I agree. But it is part of our process to learning, going from the concrete to the abstract. I mean, how long does it take a human mind to be able to think abstractly? Well, you know, we do abstract thinking from the very beginning. When we look at children and their imaginary play, that's a very abstract kind of thought process. And over the course of their formal education, they learn to uh, give words to their abstract thinking. So from the very beginning, we are moving from concrete to abstract. And all of learning, in, in essence, is the movement from physical representations to abstract representations. But abstract representations are actually more true than the physical representation. So I don't like to talk about this as an either or proposition. What I like to talk about is the process of going from the, ana from the mutashave, the analogy, to the position of yaqeen, the position of certainty, muhkam. So it's not that the verses of the Quran, all of the verses at the end are muhkam. But remember, the Quran has, and all revelation has 70 layers of meaning. Right? So depending on where you are on any particular point, you could be muhkam on something, mutashab on another thing, you know, and so on and so forth. So this verse is really outlining a process, a process of movement from analogy to certainty. And that is the mathematical philosophical way, is that we are in the search of certainty. Our goal is to become certain. And what we mean by certain is yaqeen, to become uh, know the absolute and um, and so that verse is actually very good because it's outlining a methodology for us it's a clear methodology see that, ver that verse in Surah Al-Imran is also condemning the people who stay at the mutashabah level or try to make the mutashabah into something it's not so that is what the, the, the verse is rebuking is those who stay in the shadows without looking for the higher transcendent truth. And, and Plato gives this analogy of the cave, right? Yes. The cave is a very beautiful analogy of the relationship between mutashabeh and muhkam. Because the, muh, the shadows, and I'll explain this in the coming days, but the shadows are the mutashabeh because they are a simile of a higher truth, but the truth is something that can only be gotten to when you leave the cave, right? And so uh, that is the problem usually with those people in religion who become very dogmatic, is that they stick to a lower level of the understanding and they refuse to expand into higher levels of, of abstraction. And in some cases, they reject that type of process altogether. Uh, and we see this in the history of, uh, last time we talked about the burning of the libraries that was, that was done in the Fatimiya by um, the Caliph Salahuddin, or I like to call him Kharabuddin, the one who burned and broke down religion uh, and really ushered in the contemporary period of Jahiliya that we see in the world. The, the, the extreme literalism, the extreme attachment to the muhkam, thinking that the muhkam means that is something different. So we could just do muhkam and leave. No, it's actually a relationship between the two. It is a relation. If you, if you just do analogy without the purpose of becoming muhkam, well, then you make, the mis you make other kinds of errors. So this is a dialectical process that we need to really understand as opposed to choosing between muhkam or trying to decide. Because then you run into the problem. Well, what's muhkam? Who decides what's muhkam? What Quran says, yeah. Quran divide. Yeah. Quran. Well, I'm saying, I'm saying, according to Ahl al-Bayt, everything is muhkam at the end, ultimately. Yeah. And sometimes, through the Shabbat, you really land on the very understanding of the muhkam. Yeah. Without them, you won't. So it's a matter of faith. Right. So let's take, let's take a muhkam ayah, like, Qul huwa Allah ahad. Everybody would agree this is very muhkam. Say Allah is one. Okay, now you want me, I can turn this into mutashabah ayah as well. What is one? One what? What kind of one? So that now, that same verse has both features. It depends on 
how I start to ask questions about it, right? Um, so it's a very mohkam ayah, it's something everyone agrees on, but then the application of it, what is one? One is a mathematical concept, right? Um, and you have to develop, you know, it could, it, it's, it's so important that you could spend your whole life bringing oneness to everything, right? And this is the process of extracting لِيُخْرَجَ مِنِ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُورِ uh, extracting from the darknesses of multiplicity and, and going into the singularity of Nur, right? This is kind of what our lives are. We look like multiple people in this physical realm, but if we go to a higher level of wavelength, it all looks like one, right? That's because that's the ghayb, right? Um, and we are always being invited to الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Those who um, believe in that which is beyond their five senses, right? And the, the way you gain certainty in those things that are beyond your senses is through the process of mutashabih. Allah says we, we, we use similitudes to talk. Masal. We use similitudes to talk and through these similitudes you um, learn about the higher truths. So 